Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming our moderator, Dr. John Holdren, and special guest, Gudni Johannesson, the president of Iceland. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It is a particular pleasure for me to be able to uh, formally introduce uh, His Excellency Gudni Johansson, who is the president of Iceland. Uh, I had the great privilege of meeting President Johansson in October when we took a group of uh, students and faculty members from the uh, embryonic Harvard Arctic Initiative, which we have begun at the Kennedy School. Uh, <laughs> Obviously, some of those students and faculty members are here, uh, are here this afternoon. We had a great time, and uh, President Johansson uh, received us and spent an inordinate amount of time with us in conversation, uh, particularly with the students, uh, at his amazing residence, uh, at the amazing residence of the president and his lovely wife, who was here sitting in the front row. Uh, and <laughs> The president has an amazing background. He is the sixth president in Icelandic history since they became independent, declared independent in 1944. Uh, I would add that I am the same age as uh, independent Iceland. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Before taking office in 2016, he was a professor. He was a professor of history at the University of Iceland. Uh, lectured at that university and many other universities abroad, has written numerous books and articles about uh, modern Icelandic history, including uh, Iceland's Cod Wars with the United Kingdom, the Icelandic presidency and Icelandic politics, Iceland's security issues during the Cold War, uh, the 2008 Iceland financial crisis, um, a remarkable background for someone who is to become uh, the president of his country. He holds a bachelor's degree in history and political science from Warwick University in England, master's degrees in history from the University of Iceland and Oxford University, and a PhD in history from Queen Mary University of London. So without further ado, let me turn the floor over to President Johansson. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone. What a privilege and honor it is to be here at this forum uh, and good fun. Lessons from Iceland, a nation striving to punch above its weight in a globalized world. In 2016, the Icelandic men's soccer team made it to the European finals in France. A tremendous achievement, smallest nation ever. We did really well there. Uh, we reached the quarterfinals by beating England 2-1. <laughs> I was there, Eliza was there. Uh, and, you know, the Icelandic national team gained international attention for its success on the field, but also off the field for this so-called uh, Viking clap or Viking war chant. And one newspaper talked about it as... Uh, uh, I said, most people assume the song comes from an ancient pre-battle ritual. I'll come back to that later on. But Icelandic women have also done amazingly well on the soccer field. They had already made it to the European finals, and they were in that tournament again uh, last year, and, and we were there as well. And, uh, and then the dream continued. Uh, the men's team uh, made it to the World Cup finals in Russia this summer. Uh, by far the smallest nation ever to make it to the World Cup soccer finals. And it's quite an achievement. There are many, well, mid-sized states that didn't make, make it to Russia. And <laughs> even, even bigger than mid-sized states. <laughs> so we were punching above our weight in the, in, the, in the soccer field. How come? Can we learn something from Iceland's success in sports? Well, one lesson is that uh, we fear no one, but we respect everyone. And that's the key 
if you want to succeed in the field of sports. That's why we could beat bigger teams, uh, stronger teams. That's why we could punch above our weight. Now, you need to know a thing or two about Iceland and Icelandic history. Uh, this is sort of a one paragraph history of Iceland. It is a rugged volcanic island in the middle of the North Atlantic, settled in the 9th and 10th centuries by people of mainly Norse, but also Celtic origin. The chieftains of the land, they founded parliament, uh, writers composed Icelandic sagas, a glorious contribution to the world's literature. Uh, Iceland then came under Norwegian and later Danish rule. Uh, centuries passed in poverty and decline. But then in the mid 19th century, there was a national awakening led by Icelandic intellectuals. And in 1944, the year John was born, <laughs> we gained uh, independence. Iceland became an independent republic in 1944. And we have enjoyed prosperity uh, ever since. Uh, despite, the, it was a small mishap in 2008, spectacular <laughs> banking collapse. So in short, it's a story of sort of a rise and fall and rise again. Uh, and recent history has a number of examples about the Icelanders punching above their weight. Uh, you can trust me, I'm, I'm a historian. Trust me, I'm a historian. What kind of phrase is that? <laughs> but one of the best examples would be this one. We don't talk with the British. We beat them. <laughs> and, you know, what a venue to, what a venue to, uh, to, to quote these words here, in, here, in, here at Harvard. You know, we're, we're in Boston. We're so close to Boston Harbor, uh, the story of the Boston sea, Tea Party and all the rest of it. We don't talk with the Brits. We beat them. <laughs> these words uh, come from the first Cod War, 1958. Caught war. What a funny phrase that would be for most of you, I think. Uh, it was a series of fishing disputes from the 1950s to the 1970s. So Iceland, being in the North Atlantic, relies heavily on fisheries, the rich fishing grounds around Iceland. And Iceland wanted to extend its fishing limits, gain control of the fishing grounds. The British, with heavy fishing interests there for decades, centuries, refused, said, Three mile limit of territorial waters, that is international law. Beyond that, you have the high seas, and you are not allowed to extend that limit. So when Iceland did that, moving first from three to four miles, and then from four to 12 in 1958, Britain protested and sent in the Royal Navy to protect, to protect the, uh, the uh, British trawlers, trawler is a fishing vessel, uh, from harassment by Icelandic gunboats. So trawling, trawling is like, uh, let me see, I'm improvising a bit here now. Trawling is like this. This is a trawl. And assume that it's not just full of Icelandic water, but Icelandic water that is full of fish. And here's the trawler. And then you, you, the trawler is, is catching the trawl, and in goes the trawl, full of fish, full of Icelandic fish. And we do not want that. So. The Icelandic gunboats, they would sail to the trawler, and my grandfather was on one of the, he was a gunboat captain. They would sail to the trawlers in the, in the fishing uh, regions and bring a big loud hailer and shout in strong Icelandic accent, you are fishing illegally in Icelandic waters, leave immediately. And the British trawler men would reply, uh, no, thank you. We're not going. A, a bit more impolite, as you can imagine. But that was the end of that, basically. Uh, the Icelanders could not do any more, especially with British warships around. Fortunately for Iceland, uh, the law of the sea was developing in Iceland's favor. So the 12 mile limit became uh, the common norm. So ultimately, Britain backed down. But then in the 1970s, we Icelanders got the idea of expanding the limit to 50 miles and then 200 miles. And again, Britain protested. And again, they sent in the warships. 
And again, you were faced with a situation of not being able to do so much on the fishing grounds. But then, fortunately, we invented a secret weapon, Iceland's contribution to military warfare. The trawler has reappeared <laughs> with a troll full of fish, and they want to drag in the troll. And there are trawler wires between, you understand? We invented the troll wire cutters. <laughs> so you have it like this. They want, want to catch the troll, but the gunboats would sail in the wake of the trawler with a cutter, cut the wires, so down goes the troll, fish doesn't go into the British trawler, and you have very, very unhappy British trawlermen. <laughs> this changed the rules of the game, and ultimately uh, uh, Iceland won. Furthermore, the British had the Royal Navy there, Royal Navy frigates, full of weaponry, advanced weaponry, but Iceland was and is a member of NATO, and there was a very important U.S. military base uh, in Iceland. So you could, not, you could not fire at Icelandic gunboats. That was strategically impossible because uh, whenever uh, things got really dangerous, and dangerous they were on the fishing grounds, the uh, Icelandic ministers would basically, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm simplifying a complex story, but they would just call up Washington, D.C. and say, like, hold on, you're either with us or you're with, with them. You either ask the Brits to back down or we will shut down the U.S. base. We will leave NATO. And the communists and the socialists in Iceland will gain in power. And do you want that <laughs> in the middle of the Cold War? No, you don't. So there was always pressure on Britain to back down for strategic interests. And that's how Iceland could punch above its weight. We had the law of the sea developing in our favor, and we had the strategic importance. But, you know, this is, this is a very complex story. I wrote a PhD about this, so I think it's quite an achievement to describe it in a few minutes. <laughs> now, uh, yeah, there was one phrase, there was one quotation I was going to mention in this regard. Like, this is not just a story of Icelandic fishing dispute with Britain. It has, you know, there are lessons to be learned from this. Uh, in the midst of one of the Cod Wars in 1973, uh, U.S. President Nixon and French President Pompidou had a summit in, in Iceland. And um, accompanying Nixon was the National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger. And uh, he looked at this dispute, and he just felt, wow. How can this happen? And he wrote in his, in his memoirs, and I'm going to quote Henry Kissinger here. Uh, I sat there in wonderment. Here was an island with a population of 200,000, threatening to go to war with a world power of 50 million over codfish. <laughs> I thought of a comment by Bismarck over a century earlier that the weak gain strength through effrontery and the strong grow weak because of inhibitions. So you see... This is a classic story about the complexities of power, how a small nation can use its strategic leverage to have its way against a much bigger, much bigger state. So for students of uh, international relations, political science, study the Cod Wars. They tell you a lot about how, what weak states can do, or weaker states. Uh, Iceland is a small state, but when you're president, you have to be careful about using that phrase, I guess. But uh, this is a classic case of, of, of a small state, of a small state uh, having its way in the international arena. Now, Nixon and Pompidou convened in Iceland, and I want to focus a bit on, you know, Iceland punching above its weight and what Iceland can do to sort of, I don't know, make this world a better place. Uh, there was a summit, there was another more famous summit in 1986 when Reagan and Gorbachev convened in Reykjavik and, you know, almost ended the Cold War there. Uh, nothing came off that, but, uh, but ever since, uh, Icelanders have, have kind of liked the idea that we could be, there could be a meeting place in Iceland for uh, a site for summits and, and, and conferences. And I can mention here that uh, back home we have the Reykjavik Peace Center, or the Höfði Peace Center, named after Höfði House, 
the house where uh, Reagan and Gorbachev uh, met. It's a haunted house, by the way. <laughs> and another clear success story would be the Arctic Circle. Uh, it's an annual conference on Arctic affairs in Reykjavik and with uh, various offshoots uh, every year, Arctic forums. Now, the Arctic Circle is the brainchild of uh, my predecessor, Olavur Ragnar Grimsson, and it has become the venue for Arctic uh, uh, debates, uh, a meeting point for statespersons, officials, politicians, academics, NGOs, and so on and so forth. So that's something where we can contribute, I think, and also because the Arctic concerns us Icelanders. Uh, Iceland lies just south of the Arctic Circle, uh, but a large share of Iceland's ocean jurisdiction is within the, the Arctic region. So can we punch above our weight in the Arctic? Uh, the region is of interest to many states, the US, Canada, Russia, China, uh, to name the biggest ones. The region is rich in natural resources, and there is strategic value as well, uh, possibilities of new shipping routes. But the environment is fragile. The environment is very fragile up there. And environmental concerns should come first. Uh, and the interests of indigenous peoples uh, living in the Arctic and their right to determine their own future and to take the long-term view. And to take the long-term view. Now, at the end of last year, a new government came to power in Iceland. A uh, three-party coalition from left to right. Uh, it's a unique combination. And you, yeah, you have to keep in mind that in Iceland we have the system of proportional representation for you students of political science here. Uh, so it's a 63-member parliament. And after the elections, we had eight parties represented there. And impossible to form a majority uh, by, by two parties. It had to be three or more. Uh, so... Uh, after a fairly long uh, time of discussions and deb debates, we had this new government. And its agenda on the Arctic is quite clear, and I will quote uh, the government uh, platform there. Within the Arctic Council, Iceland will highlight the UN's global goals, climate issues, and matters concerning the ocean. In accordance with its approved policy on the Arctic, Iceland will place emphasis on respect for the rights of indigenous peoples and gender equality. So, like Iceland will not decide the future of the Arctic, but we can definitely play a constructive role uh, there. Uh, next year, Iceland will take on the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, and we look forward to making our voice heard in that capacity. Even though you cannot, you know, decide the the uh, the uh, way things go, you can influence. You can set the framework. You can you can use persuasion, and as for, for a small nation, that is essential, that you hold on to that, you know. We cannot put our fist down and say, all right, President Putin, all right, President Trump, this is what we Icelanders are going to tell you what to do. It doesn't work like that, but we can use the powers of persuasion. And that's why we can live together in this, in this globalized uh, world, hopefully. Now, Climate issues, sustainability, future of the oceans. Uh, the ocean is also our fatherland. These are lines from a very popular poem uh, from the middle of the 20th century. In the 20th century, witness the Cod Wars, the fisheries were so important for Iceland. Uh, mainstay of the Icelandic economy. And uh, after the Cod Wars, after we had gained full control of our fishing grounds, there was this feeling that we could just go on fishing ourselves as much as we wanted. But we quickly realized that that was not the case. Uh, we had to impose a quota system. Uh, a system whereby we decide the uh, annual catch limit. It's a system not without its flaws, not without its drawbacks. But we can safely say that we have managed to avoid the danger of overfishing and, and stock depletion. And outside Iceland, many nations are interested to learn about uh, how we do things in this regard. Now, in a few weeks, I will attend a, uh, an interesting event, or another interesting event, <laughs> uh, 
the World Ocean Summit in, uh, in Mexico. And the message from Iceland will be clear there that we need to protect the oceans. We need to clean up the oceans. One example is, unless we do something, unless we do something, by the middle of this century, people estimate that there will be more plastic than fish in the oceans. And, you know, we're not going to consume plastic. So uh, let's do something about this. And I like to think that we, Icelanders, or representatives of Iceland, will be listened to in international forums when people actually understand that we, we know what we're talking about. We know what we're talking about when it comes to the future of the oceans. We rely so heavily on fishing and healthy oceans. So, you know, there are many, many things I need to talk about. How we can punch above our weight. Gender equality. Uh, Iceland has a good record. There are tales of strong women in the Icelandic sagas, which I mentioned to you. Let me just tell you a story of Hallgerður Langbrók. She was a strong woman. She was the wife of Gunnar from Hlíðarendi. Gunnar once slapped her in anger. And then she said those famous words. Man, one day you're going to regret this. <laughs> Some years later, Gunnar's enemies had encircled him on their farm. And he was, he was, he was uh, fighting with a bow and shooting arrows. And then, all of a sudden, the thread of the bow got torn. And Gunnar turns to Hallgerður and says, Give me some hair, woman. I need to repair my, my bow. And then she said, well, do you remember when you hit me? And do you remember I said one day you would regret that? <laughs> there you are. You're not getting any hair from me to repair your bow. And Gunnar said, fair enough. And died, was killed. <laughs> so Hallgerður is a strong woman image. Forceful woman. I look, you just read the saga of Bernd Njál and you get the proper version of this. In 1975, in Iceland, we had the uh, women's strike in order to demonstrate the importance of women in the workforce and at home. Women laid down work. Said, okay, it's up to you men. You run this economy and these homes of ours. I was uh, seven at the time, and my father, bless his memory, uh, cooked for me and my younger brother that evening uh, hot dogs. <laughs> and they all got burst, and we were like, Dad! <laughs> but it was a tremendous demonstration of the importance of women in the workplace, women in the household, of the need to reach gender equality. In 1980, a big milestone. Icelanders elected uh, Vigdís Finnbogadóttir as president, the first democratically elected head of state. She was one of four candidates, and uh, it was a close call. And there were many, many elements in society wondering, can a woman be president. And not only that, Vigdís was single. And not only that, she was a single mother. Can a single mother be president? And there were some who said, sorry, you know, I'm all for gender equality, but you know how these sentences go. <laughs> so for instance, one person wrote about how Vigdís the single mother could not be president because how would she greet dignitaries when they came to Iceland if she were elected? And let's imagine this for a while. Okay, let's assume this woman, Vigdís, is elected president. And the first head of state to come to Iceland on an official visit is usually uh, the head of state in Denmark, the Queen of Denmark. And her husband, Prince Henrik, will accompany her. And then they will drive up to Bessastadir, the president's residence, where Eliza and I now live. And they will come up to the main entrance, 
And Vigdis will stand there outside the door and come to greet them. But this will not do. She will come and greet the queen. Your majesty, nice to see you. Welcome to Iceland. But who's going to greet the prince? <laughs> she will be there all by herself. And this, this is impossible. This cannot work. <laughs> Vigdis had a solution. We always have a solution. You know what she did? She greeted the queen, and then she greeted the prince. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> so, but she was elected. We're proud of that. She's still going strong. Uh, a wonderful person. When she was, uh, when she took office in the tiny parliament house in the downtown Reykjavik. Uh, there were about 100 persons present. There was Vigdis, three other women, and then a bit over 100 men. This was the world she entered. But we're moving on. I will come to that. So uh, I could talk also about our Nordic model, where we can punch up our weight, show others how to do things. But uh, I want to have time for discussion as well. We're, we're always happy, we're always smiling, we're quirky, we're uh, enthusiastic, we welcome visitors from all parts of the world. Uh, it just couldn't be better. And did you notice, it's never, it never rains in Iceland. <laughs> the weather is always fantastic. I was an academic. Uh, in academia, you're meant to be critical. You're meant to be a skeptic. Not worry about what's best for the authorities, what's best for your country, as it were. You're meant to be truthful to academic uh, working methods. Veritas. Huh. That's the motto of Harvard. My role as president maybe, yes, to promote Iceland and be optimistic. I mean, you, you can't have a pessimistic president. Like, you know, I can't have a, I can't deliver a New Year's address saying like, well, my fellow Icelanders, things are looking gloomy. I'm pretty pessimistic. This is going to be a bad year. I can sense it. I can feel it. <laughs> that, no, I'm not asking for that. You have to be optimistic. You have to be confident that if you put your effort into it, you will make the world a better place. Today will be better than yesterday. Things will take time. If we work together, we're, we'll move in the right direction. I'm all for that. But not to create a rosy picture, not to create a false image of the perfect society, because it will just hit you. Ultimately, it will just hit you. So a few caveats. And let's begin with the so-called Viking war chant. There's nothing Viking about it at all. <laughs> it was uh, discovered in Iceland in 2014 when a Scottish soccer team came to Iceland and they did the Viking war chant, Motherwell of Scotland. And I've also heard that there's some team in Poland also doing this. So there's nothing ancient Viking-esque about it at all. And if you go to Iceland, and I encourage you to visit this lovely island of ours, uh, don't assume that all Icelanders will be desperate to do the Viking clap with, with you. <laughs> but we'll certainly do it at, uh, at the World Cup in Russia this, this summer. And, you know, the Cod Wars. I wrote a lot about the Cod Wars as a, as a historian. And I pointed out that, yes, our gunboat captains were brave and heroic and Icelandic determination was a key factor in our ultimate success. But you have to take into consideration as well Iceland's strategic importance, the development of the law of the sea, and therefore you cannot just credit heroic Icelanders for victory. It was a part of a bigger story. Nations in South America were declaring 200 mile fishing limits decades before us. So we followed in their footsteps. We were not the icebreakers as it were. And it was not a proper war, uh, you know, caught wars is a misnomer of sorts. And this, this actually hit me in the presidential campaign. I mean, who is this person saying our glorious gunboat captains didn't, didn't uh, secure a victory and uh, 
and I also mentioned that we Icelanders were not always uh, united and so on and so forth. So, so uh, if you want to become president or head of state, uh, be careful about what you write as historians. <laughs> uh, gender equality, to conclude on that. Yes, yes, we have done well, we Icelanders, but there's still so much work to do. Most recently, uh, Parliament adopted a, a law on gender equality, uh, strive for equal uh, pay, of course, uh, in the workplace, and, and put in effect uh, ways to make sure that we have equal pay in the workforce. And we're all for that, uh, but the proof is in the pudding. It depends on whether it's actually enforced. Furthermore, uh, out of CEOs in Icelandic companies, and I think I know this uh, correctly, only 11% are women. So uh, let's not just pride ourselves of big steps we've taken, there's still a there's still long way to go, and we need to work on this together. Furthermore, the Me Too campaign, the Me Too uprising, was certainly felt in Iceland. Women in, in the movies, in the theater, in parliament, in academia, uh, in sports, Women in Iceland have come forward and told terrible tales of sexual harassment and sexual violence. Only earlier this week, women of uh, foreign origin were the last ones to come forward, and there will be more. There will be more. Uh, clearly, so much needs to be done still. So it's not just smiles and happy weather. Uh, if we're going to pride ourselves of how well we have been doing in sports, we better make sure that we fight sexual harassment and sexual violence in the fields of sports and other aspects of society. So uh, that is, to conclude, uh, my final message. We in Iceland can punch above our weight. We can be a shining example to others only if we admit that there is still a long way to go to create the perfect society in which we want to live, the society we want to create for our children and our grandchildren. Uh, let's be optimistic, let's be determined, but let's also be realistic. And when it comes to Iceland, a small nation in the North Atlantic, let's also be realistic about our capabilities in the wider world. We can influence, but we can never determine. But when you think about it, what's wrong with trying to influence events? Why do we always have to aim for that bit extra? Is it much better to be able to decide? I think influencing can be a better way to move forward. Finally, before you take the stage as well, punching above our weight is good, yes. But uh, a few years ago, uh, another president, President Thomas Ilves of Estonia, was asked about his hopes for his country's future. Estonia had been under Soviet rule and oppression for decades. They were emerging from that shadow. What's your future? What's your hope? And he said, well, we just want to become another boring Nordic country. <laughs> and I can agree with him on that. I want to be head of state of a boring country <laughs> where things are in order, where people can feel secure, and then you will find out that individuals can prosper. If, the, if we create the societal safety, then individuals will aspire, find their dreams, make them come true. And it is a society where we help each other. Because if we help each other, if you find out that you have a disease, if you find out that your kid needs treatment, then it is better to live in a society where we help each other. That is the key, I think. A safety net, a society of togetherness and tolerance where each, and each individual can still make his or her dreams come true. Uh, then you don't have to punch above your weight. You just have to be living in a boring Nordic country. Thank you very much.
Thanks. So we are now going to have uh, a period of time for questions and answers. We have uh, two mics at the back of these two aisles. We have two mics uh, up on the first or second balcony. Uh, while folks are lining up there, let me ask the first question, and then we'll sure. start turning to the mics. Uh, my first question uh, for the afternoon is, uh, President Johansson, you uh, talked about the Cod Wars of the 50s and the 70s when the adversary was the United Kingdom. Uh, in what you might call the Cod Wars of the 2010s, the adversaries, as you've noted, include plastics in the ocean, they include mm. acidification, they include warming, uh, they include uh, overfishing even by uh, Icelanders. Uh, but particularly with respect to the aspects of those problems that are global, the plastics, the acidification, uh, the warming. Uh, say a little more about how Iceland is planning to play in that arena to protect its interests in its uh, fisheries and more broadly its climate. Yeah, thank you. Well, first, be aware that uh, the position of the president of Iceland is <coughs> on a day-to-day -day basis, non-political. Uh, we have a prime minister uh, and a government where uh, politi political decisions uh, are made. So, uh, so uh, I do not run uh, or Icelandic policy when it comes to, to politics on a day-to-day -day basis. But uh, I um, can safely say that uh, uh, when it comes to the future of the oceans and climate change, uh, it is a it is a it's a cross it goes across the political spectrum that the Icelanders agree on on uh, uh, on uh, uh, positive action. Uh, the Icelandic government is guided by the uh, goals of the uh, Paris Agreement to uh, to limit, and I'm just quoting here. I'm not trying to pull you into thinking that I have memorized this. Iceland is guided by the goal of the Paris Agreement of 2015 to limit the average increase of the temperature of the Earth's atmosphere to 1.5 degrees from the reference level. Yeah, this is centigrade. The main aim of the government's climate policy is to avoid negative effects of climate change on marine life. In no other part of the world has the temperature risen as much as it has in the Arctic. And Iceland is moreover bound to achieve a 40% reduction in emissions of greenhouse gases uh, by 2030. It is the government's wish to go further than is envisaged in the Paris Agreement and to aim to have a carbon neutral Iceland by 2040 at the latest. So this, this gives you an indication of the, of the uh, positive goals and aims and, uh, and whether, yeah, whether they will actually be implemented. We just have to see. We have to wait, well, till 2040 for some of it. Uh, but Iceland wants to play a constructive role on the, in the international arena and because we rely so much, we still rely so much on, on fisheries and unless we protect the oceans, uh, this treasure for ours will be in, in serious and possibly immediate danger. So, uh, so uh, that is the, the, those concerns guide Iceland's, foreign, uh, Iceland's policy in that regard. So the first one I saw up is up on the balcony. Please uh, briefly introduce yourself and remember that a question is no more than two sentences, the second of which ends in a question mark. <laughs> Hi, my name is Isabel. I'm a sophomore at the college. I'm also concerned with environmental issues, um, and I understand that Iceland is a champion of sustainable fishing. One question I did have, though, is regarding the whaling practices in Iceland. I know this is one of the more controversial <coughs> issues, but I was wondering if you kind of see that as a contradiction to what some of the things you were saying about protecting our oceans. Mm -hmm. uh, whaling has been a controversial issue uh, for decades. Uh, in the late 1980s, I was studying in the UK uh, when... Uh, whaling was even more contentious than it is today. And, you know, I was just a kid. I had no interest in hunting whales, you know, in, in that regard. But I remember the sense of sort of uh, nationalism, as it were, or, or sort of they're ganging up on us Icelanders, as it were. 
So I felt like, all right, hold on. If we want to catch whales, we, we will just do that. We will not let foreigners tell us what we can do in Iceland. That was the sense. Uh, whaling has dramatically decreased in Iceland in, uh, in recent years and decades. And uh, Icelanders certainly do not hunt uh, uh, the types which are or have been in at the, in, at the risk of extinction. Uh, but it is the uh, policy of the government of Iceland to keep open the option of uh, hunting uh, certain species of whales which are not in the, uh, being in the, uh, at the risk of extinction. And uh, at the same time, uh, the government is aware of the fact that this is noticed abroad. So uh, uh, I, would, I would be, uh, yeah, I, very possibly you could see a change in that, but that would be up to the government and parliament to decide. Thank you. Good. David. <clears throat> uh, my name is David Eves. I'm a lecturer here at the Kennedy School. Um, Goodney, uh, the, you, kind of, you rode a wave of populism in, as part of your election. And kind of people here, I think there's been a wave of populism around the world, and people, many people here kind of look at that populism with a lot of concern. But they look at you and they go, well, Goodney's not so bad. <laughs> Having a good name would be great. So I think I have a question for you is, as someone who has thought critically about politics, do you look at populism, populism as just a benign thing that's going on that you're a happy accident of? Is it a negative thing from which you're a happy accident, but you're like, you know, I'm a lucky outcome, we should be more careful? Or are you going to, actually, populism is good, it requires people to be more responsive, politicians be more responsive, and, and, I'm, an, and I'm, a, I'm a reaction to that. Right, and so yeah. you want more good news. Uh -huh. Where do you fall on this? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, you're allowed to say, I don't know, I hope. Um, <coughs> you know, populism is um, a negative term, at least in, uh, in, in academia, I think, you know. Uh, people have been rising up against the elite, right. We have had enough of the elite. The people decide. You have seen this in, you've seen this theme in elections around the world. I think we here at this distinguished venue uh, need to think a lot about this. Are you guys, are we the elite? In a certain way we are. It's a privilege for you guys to be here. It is certainly a privilege for me to be in the position in which I am. But you are or will become experts. You are or will become experts in your field. You will be able to say, listen, I am right on this and you are not right on this. And why is that so? Because I have looked at the issue at hand. You have not. Therefore, I am telling you that this is how things are. Now, does this not sound though arrogant with all expertise there must come humility as well, or humbleness. You must be humble as you project your knowledge and expertise. And maybe that has been lacking a bit. Maybe that's why we have this rise of uh, anger towards the so-called elites. Maybe that is why those who support populism have gained the ground we can see. So I think for us in academia, like I'm, I'm on unpaid leave at the University of Iceland, so I can still call myself member of academia. Maybe we need to understand that even though we are experts in a certain field, uh, that does not mean that we have the answers to everything. And that does not mean that we should uh, show a level of arrogance, which sometimes comes with being in academia. And, you know, I just know this. I was in this business. Uh, and that is why perhaps populism has arisen. Now, why I was elected in Iceland, it's a, it's a long story, and certainly it was never on the agenda. Uh, the stars just happened to align at the same, at, at the perfect place for me in the spring of 2016. And I just think, uh, I, I think that my success in the elections uh, has very little to do with a general trend of populism in the, in the outside world. It just demonstrates the, 
the importance of looking at each event separately as well. You know, contingency matters as well. Uh, so uh, it was not sort of, uh, well, there was one thing there. I, one of the reasons I was elected was the fact that I was not a politician. Icelanders were uh, tired of politicians. I think I can safely say that. Uh, and they wanted someone, me or somebody else, who had no connections with the political world. Uh, that is the sort of populist aspect of my election, I should think. Up on the balcony. Mr. President, thank you for joining us uh, this Friday. My name is Ernesto Di Vittorio. I'm a National Security Fellow here at the Kennedy School. You expounded upon uh, Iceland's conflict with Britain in the Cod Wars. So moving into today, what are your views of the contested waters in the South China Sea and the East China Sea? And if you were to inform some of those nations' intention with the People's Republic of China right now, yeah. how might you advise them? Well, yes, if only I were still an academic. <laughs> <laughs> One day after my election, I did some interview and I got a text message from a good friend of mine. Good name. You are no longer an academic. Be careful. <laughs> now, I, I, know, I don't know the, the specific aspects of that dispute. I would only advise uh, caution and moderation and uh, not resort to, to any use of force. But it, since you mentioned it, a good friend of mine uh, in the, at, the Reyk, at Reykjavik University, at the Department of Law there, uh, he's, been, he's been advising on this dispute. But, uh, you know, you have to find the middle ground, I should think. Uh, one of the um, blessings of Iceland is that we're in the middle of nowhere up in the North Atlantic, so, so the issue of median lines didn't ar arise until we expanded the limit to 200 miles. Then, we then you know, you had to find the median line between Iceland and the Faroe Islands on the one hand, and Iceland and Greenland on the other. So, I mean, the principle of finding the middle ground surely must play, play some, uh, imp uh, have, a, have, a, have a bearing there. So, uh, so those are my words of wisdom there. Thank you. Over here, please. Mr. President, hello again. My yeah. name is Cecilia Nicolini. I'm a research fellow at the Ash Center. And during the last years, uh, Iceland has been uh, in the papers for pushing and promoting very innovative policies and projects. Some of them were failed, like the crowdsourced constitution, which was about to be the most equal and transparent constitution. Uh, some others uh, were very successful, like recently the law that you passed for mm -hmm. paying women and no pay women no less than men for equal job, uh, which that is very very inspiring. And other ones maybe more controversial, like trying to uh, forbid the pineapple in pizza. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I would like to learn what is this uh, innovative in the DNA of Iceland and what would be the next breakthrough innovation in Iceland uh, government? Yeah, again, you know, I'm not the salesperson for Iceland, but I will, let, I will still let you know that being small does have its advantages. So I think maybe in Iceland, if you're a kid and you think, you know, I want to, I want to be on the national team in basketball or gymnastics or soccer or whatever. I want to be on the symphony orchestra. I want to invent uh, medicine that cures cancer. Uh, the dream isn't as far away uh, possibly as it is possibly in bigger countries. So maybe because we are small, uh, uh, it gives you the belief that you can make things happen. Uh, Eliza, my wife, who is here with us, she often tells the story of people working many jobs in Iceland. You know, you're a carpenter and you're also uh, working in some other position. Then you're in the choir as well and you're coaching the soccer team and, you know, you're doing many things. And maybe that helps us as well. Because if you're just boxed in one field, then you become an expert there and don't know a thing about anything else. So maybe diversifying like this Helps you, helps you a bit. Uh, and then, as, as the skeptic academic I once was, I would say, well, give me proof that we are actually more innovative than others. Okay, we have about four minutes left and three questioners standing, so let's turn to the uh, balcony, and please be brief. 
Hi, thank you very much for, for coming to visit. I hope to return the favor and come to Iceland someday. You're always welcome. It was uh, a glorious country, as you can see here. Thank you. My name is Tyler Levine. I'm a, I'm a senior at the college. I, uh, I was reading recently about how uh, a lot of mothers in Iceland are choosing the option of terminating a pregnancy if they mm. find out that the baby has uh, Down syndrome in particular, but potentially other um, kind of genetic abnormalities. And I was, uh, you know, we saw all those beautiful, smiling people, happy in the, in the video. Um, how do you think about th this practice, mm -hmm. I guess, from a governmental regulation standpoint and also just from, I guess, a moral standpoint, but I, I'll, yeah. whatever you're comfortable with. No, yeah. Uh, there is no law in Iceland uh, on termination of pregnancy when you, uh, when there's, when you detect uh, Down syndrome. That was the misconception that was brought to the world. Attempted to use the word fake news. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing like that. But you are right, though. Uh, again, the smallness of Iceland has to be taken into account. It is very easy to, to conduct uh, nationwide screening during pregnancy. And their ter termination of pregnancy is allowed in Iceland, and uh, that is the law. What we need to look at is the ethical aspect and the moral aspect which you mentioned. Has it been the case that people advising mothers and parents have been telling them, advising them, hinting that it would be wise to terminate this pregnancy because children and people with Down syndrome will not lead a happy life. That is intolerable. That is not the way we want things done. Last year, I was privileged to have at Bessastadir, the president's residence, uh, kids and grown-ups from the Down syndrome society. And the kids are as happy as you can get. So that is the issue we have to confront. That when doctors and others in the medical profession or the w advising parents and mothers, you should not do something like that. Create an image of a definitely unhappy life for an individual with Down syndrome, because that is not the case. And that would be my message and just emphasize that uh, there is no law of this kind, but you are right, the percentage of uh, people with Down syndrome has gone down because of screening and possibly because of uh, practice of giving advice, which is not the way it should be done. I think this is going to be the last one. Thank you for joining us, Mr. President. Uh, my name is David Su. I'm a junior in the college. Um, I recently heard that Iceland is making major uh, investments in its infrastructure to promote tourism, um, like a one uh, billion US dollar investment in the Keflavik airport. And I was just wondering, do you see a dilemma in balancing the concerns of um, the Icelandic people and the potential benefits from more tourism? Yes, um, uh, Iceland has enjoyed a big tourist boom. Uh, last year, I think, uh, I think I'm right on this. Uh, well over two million people visited Iceland. Uh, it has caused strains in the infrastructure, both in terms of uh, people visiting the most popular spots. Uh, nature has to be protected. Uh, the roads are uh, some, in some places narrow gravel roads and built for much less traffic than is now the case. Airbnb has blossomed in Reykjavik. Uh, students find it hard to find accommodation. Uh, people who live in uh, blocks of flats are not happy when tourists are coming in and out in the middle of the night, partying and what have you. So these are the strains you have to face. But it's still the case that Icelanders in general are very positive, very positive towards tourism, tourists. And many stories I can cite in that regard. And also uh, tourists who are asked uh, the 
experience is overwhelmingly positive. Uh, but you are right. We have reached the point where we have to really have to uh, think hard about uh, increased investment in infrastructure. I also think we need to uh, diversify a bit, uh, make people visit more places than the most popular ones so that uh, we can sort of uh, protect the most popular spots and allow people to enjoy all the spots which, are, which they don't know about already. So uh, uh, tourism is overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly positive when it comes to uh, Iceland. And uh, at the same time, there is growing awareness that, uh, that uh, we, need to, we need to invest in the infrastructure and uh, then, then we can safely move forward. Well, thank you. I hope everyone will join me in thanking President Johansson for a terrific presentation.